for the recording. Okay, started. So my name is Vladislav Babkin. So I'm currently working as a security researcher at Eclipsium. But to be honest, I'm also a little bit of engineering. I also did a lot of development. I did pen testing back in the day. So I have a lot of like different job titles and areas related to that. And also I'm a long time CTF player as part of the Team DC UA. And CTF would be a type of security competitions. So for anybody who wants to read more, there is a link here. So today we are talking about, as I already presented, how do we deal with pretty much secure random values and also secrets, because that's a pretty much very related topic. So, and the very first question to ask so is to, why do we even want to discuss those? So, and specifically we want to discuss those because those are like one of the most common vulnerabilities for specifically a last top 10 project where OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project. And uh, it's a, like, a non-profit organization which uh, works to improve like the security of applications in general and software related to the web. And one of the, their most well-known projects is the top 10 most common web application vulnerabilities project, which is, well, OWASP top 10. Mm, largely, we will be covering three of those, mainly top two the one about cryptographic fails, but also we will be checking out broken access controls and identification and authentication failures. So, and the second question to ask is what are secure random values? So how do they compare to like normal ones? And main in identification for secure random values compared to normal ones is that they are really hard to guess or predict based on observing the output of the generator. So the generator state should not be recoverable from observing the values. Values generated should be uniformly distributed and values should have enough entropies. Otherwise, like the values will not be really secure or suitable for different cryptographic purposes. And so, uh, that said, the biggest question to discuss is, okay, we have those secure random values, but where do we even have commonly in applications those values? Otherwise, our discussion would be pretty much meaningless because we don't even know where, where, where we meet them. And some of the most obvious places would be like this small list. So password is supposed to be a secure random value. So if somebody can guess your password, albeit you're a human and you're not really a secure random number generator, obviously, it would be bad. So technically, password should have a degree of randomness to it. Uh, the machine randomness come at places like tokens or session IDs, which would be a normally just a array of bytes. So which are somehow encoded into a string. So these are actually secure random values because if someone could guess your session ID, they can pretty much just take over your account or read your emails, which is not something that we would like. Um, another obvious uh, secret value is like API secret. So it's a password, but it's normally used with a application. So usually it's just generated as a large random value instead of like human created thing. Uh, encryption key is also a, an obvious uh, secure random value because if your encryption key can be broken or guessed, uh, then when somebody views your encrypted data, they can more or less easily brute force the key and decrypt it. So some of the less obvious places to meet secure random values. In some cases, uh, not always, but in some cases it would be client IDs. So when you provide an API client to say some organization, I don't know, so like name any company you want to provide a client ID to. So for example, to us, you can pretty much identify us like as a client ID of Eclipse. But the issue with that is that while it is more or less a public value, somebody who is observing the value in the database will have an idea of what customers like you might have. So it might be a good idea to have for a client ID some random value and store that instead of pretty much just broadcasting your clients to the database. So sometimes you will see client IDs to be just a random value. Uh, another place to see a random value would be a database ID. So normally from database IDs, we want some properties like, okay, we want them to be sortable 
or you want them to be more or less sequential so that we can sort by them and get sorting roughly by creation date, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one side. But on the other side, if you have something like a transaction ID, you might not want to use a sequential ID because in this case, the attacker might pretty much observe this ID and understand how much transactions happened in the system, which might be detrimental to, say, payment systems. Uh, so in some cases, we want to use a secure random value for a database ID instead, so that it's not guessable and nothing will be leaked from exposing it to the customer. Another good place to like, put a random value to is a file name on disk for a web application. So when you store user files, uh, very commonly, it's a good idea to, instead of using the user-provided value for the file name, it's usually a good idea to generate a random one and store the file with a random name while storing the original file name in the database. So in this case, you can just go for any random generator. So it's not as imperative to have a secure random value here. Mm. But if you use a secure random value, you might have like extra interesting properties. So for example, if you use a secure random value, you can use this file name as additional authentication to get this file. So for example, if you just have access to get a file by name, if the name is not guessable, you will have an extra layer of security to actually be able to get those names as well. So even if you somehow manage to expose say, credentials to your S3 bucket, if they only allow you to get a file like one of the files, not all of the files, you will also need to somehow expose file names, which might be stored in an entirely different place than your, say, Amazon S3 bucket key. So it might be an interesting security property to have. And also two places which commonly people don't consider for uh, mm, secure random values would be password reset links and stuff like invite links, et cetera, et cetera. So I have seen commonly in many applications that people use like all of the nice requirements from Avast for passwords, for session IDs, but then password reset link is pretty much just a guessable link. So you, you don't have any tokens in it or anything like that. So those links actually are like, they actually have a secure random value in them. Otherwise, anybody would be able to reset your password. And this is like a less obvious place simply because in many web applications, people gloss over it. So any questions about it? Any extra comments? I think we are good to go. Yep, yep. OK. So um, OK, so we now know where we have them. But biggest question is, how do we correctly generate them? So first idea is that, OK, we might be able to just use the language library to generate them. But in many cases, this is pretty much a very bad idea. So some of the languages have strong built-in random number generators, but just using any number generator from your language might be a bad idea because here are some examples. So there is this nice example of uh, recovery of uh, JavaScript number generator state for mass random, which is like the normal random generator generator you think about when you like talk JavaScript. And here is another example which has like state recovery for very common uh, generator generators from different languages like libc random, Mercent Vister, which is in Python, and also its variants in like PHP, Ruby, and Java. So just using your normal generator from your language might be a bad idea. So you need to consult the documentation for your language. So for example, uh, random library for Python states explicitly it's not suited for cryptographic purposes. So you should instead use, for example, Python secrets library for that. So um, we use the term, term state recovery. So basically what state recovery is, is that you observe a bunch of outputs for a generator and how much you need is dependent on the algorithm you use entirely. And you pretty much just recover the entire internal state. So you recover all of the data you need to generate future numbers and sometimes even past values as well. So practically this can mean the following. So for example, for the lottery, like the example from the list, which will actually, after we get some more theoretical material, we'll look more deeply into. It's like predicting the winning ticket. Uh, for a token, it's 
ability to predict tokens for the users who already logged in before you, and also predicting the tokens for future users. So it's like works both ways. You might want to go for past values and for future values. And for password generator, it would largely mean predicting the passwords it generated before already. So, and based on the specific place where you actually encounter this bug, the impact can be like very low or it can be like super critical. So very low would be the hacking the JavaScript water article. So while it's academically interesting, it doesn't actually impact anything but the toy water case that the uh, news article actually put up. But say you manage to predict a password for some mission critical system in a government. And that would be very critical in my case, like in, in my opinion. So, and many most common cases, it's actually high or critical. And the next question to ask is, how do you go about generating them securely then? So we cannot just readily use any library from the language. We need to actually review them. And most languages actually contain some of the good libraries. So based on languages we use in our company, I actually listed some of the generators we use. So OpenSSL random bytes is a strong one. Uh, there is also Node.js crypto random bytes. Uh, internally, it's actually based on OpenSSL as well, just nice wrapper to it. Uh, Python OSU random, it's built use operating system source at randomness source. And there is also a Python secrets package, which is a nice wrapper instead of like OSU random getting raw bytes. Python secrets will actually get you strings. So Glang crypto rand or like, like rand read. It's also sourcing uh, randomness from operating system sources, but it's using slightly different function on Windows. And for when you want to do this in a browser, there is a crypto get random values, which you can use in modern browsers. But a huge recommendation for you is, if possible, don't do any crypto in a browser. So when you deliver your source code, it's very easy to tamper with it in the browser. So I would suggest, if possible, don't do crypto. If you must, then use the Web Crypto API. Um, also, another term that we used was entropy. So we needed to provide enough entropy for the values. And entropy per Wikipedia, it's in information series, entropy of a random uh, variable is the average level of information, surprise, or uncertainty inherent to that variable of possible outcomes. To put it more simply and more readable, it's pretty much the number of bits you need to represent your information. So to give you an idea of how to estimate them, just consider a single digit. So a single digit can be represented with four bits of randomness. So with four bits of randomness, you can represent two to the power of four states, which would be 16. And that's enough to actually represent a digit. So we obviously have like six extra states, but three bits of randomness is not enough because it's just eight states to the power of three. So, and um, like normally bytes have eight bits of randomness each because eight bits. So, and specifically there should be enough entropy to prevent guessing attacks. Usually 64 bits of entropy is considered enough, but if you use a good strong random number generator, say OpenSSL or one of those I listed, it should be presumed that half of your output is actually entropy, but everything else is not. So even for good generators. So this is why we go for 128 bits, or uh, if you go for more conservative upper case estimate, we go for 256 bits of randomness, which is usually a good idea. Mm. Also, your value should be long enough to prevent birthday paradox collisions. So specifically, Thursday paradox is the idea that when you have a group of 23 people, there is a 50% chance that some pair of those people actually has a birthday on the same date, which is completely counterintuitive because you have like 256 options, oh, sorry, 365 options for the date. Uh, and uh, this is like translates into you only need about uh, square root of n items to have 50% chance of a collision. And moreover, for cryptography, 1% chance of a collision is a lot. 
So we should uh, usually target uh, something well above this paradox. So 128 bits happen to cover that as well. But it's important to keep that in mind. Mm. Taking all this information into account, again, I already said that we should use 256 bits of randomness for like tokens and similar. Like if you use less than 128 bits, it's not secure. If you use more than 256, in most cases, this is simply impractical. So you will just be getting a hugely long token that you have to send in with every request to your web application without getting any extra security. And generic recommendation for me really stick to the upper bound. Uh, then if you use encryption, usually you target something like a yes algorithm, which has 128 and 256 bit keys for the most common cases. It has a bunch more variants like this 192 bits, but uh, those are usually not used. Also, passwords can be shorter due to how they are normally handled, and we will discuss that as well. But if you are using a password manager, and I say you should, you can go for something around like 20 character passwords for important accounts, which usually provides around 100 bits of, bits of randomness. Uh, albeit, if you use 12, you're still OK. So you don't need to go and change it because I just said that you should use 20 or more. It's just that for really important accounts, it makes sense to go for, again, upper bound. So you just go for a strong password, and that's it. But one question that we didn't solve here is, how do we get the character string out of bytes? So all of the generators here generate bytes. So this generate bytes, this generate bytes, 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 and bytes. So the only exception is Python secrets package, but like recommendation to just use Python is not a great one. You should be able to use this on any language. So um, question like uh, to you, would this method of converting to string actually work? So how do we convert our bytes to a string? So this is Python code, but uh, I think it should be readable enough. So what's your take? So will this be is a strong way to get uh, numbers, or oh, sorry, letters out of bytes. Okay, no reaction from people. Um, uh, so, um, there was, um, I think, uh, can you hear? Uh, yeah. Anybody, everybody can hear properly? I think there was a... Yeah, you can hear. Okay. Okay. So just to give you a small hint. So in how many cases will zero appear and in how many cases will nine appear in this case? Considering that we get random bytes and byte is a value from zero to 255. I'm sorry, Black, could, could you repeat the question, please? So is this a good way to convert a byte array to a string while preserving all of the entropy? Something like this. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, your last hint. So hint is in how many cases will zero appear and in how many cases will nine appear given like one byte out of possible cases. Clarification is that he is generating numbers between, um, what are the ranges? Zero to 31? Yeah, zero to 255 bytes, like normal bytes. Okay. This is the range. Okay. So zero will appear in 26 cases and nine will appear in only 25. So what does this mean for us is that our probabilities are a little bit skewed towards having a nine. 
So, uh, sorry, having a zero, for example. So specifically first, like this from zero to five, you have like one more chance to get these six values instead of these four. So this doesn't reduce some non-uniformity, non meaning that options are not like equally as probable. So somebody trying to break specifically this conversion to the password will attempt to actually generate numbers from zero to five more often. And they will probably get a little bit better chance to get a password generated basis. So important point is that this is more of a theoretical vulnerability because probabilities don't differ by a huge lot. But when we're speaking about cryptography, this stuff cannot be just like thrown away. So you have to take into account even theoretical stuff like this, because who knows, maybe in future, somebody will poke a hole in, in your algorithm exactly because of this small uh, issue. So, and this issue is usually ind indicative of further issues as we will see in examples. So you, you do have to take care even of such theoretical vulnerabilities. So some of the actually working methods to go about it is to pretty much generate a new byte and regenerate if it is not in a given range. So for example, for our toy sample with 10 possible values in encoding, we can just discard the last five, uh, sorry, the last six values and we will get a uniform distribution with like uh, equal chance to get every character. But it's sometimes not really that efficient because we might get a streak of bad luck and just a lot of 250 values and we'll just go ahead and query OS for more and more randomness. So this chance of getting this streak for very, very long time is not big, but still it's like extra operations, extra delay, which sometimes might just randomly appear. Uh, Another idea would be to use an encoding that maps every possible generated value one to one to some sequence of characters. So one example is hex encoding. Another example is base64. It's conserving slightly more space. And in this case, you don't care that in that encoding, some specific characters might appear more often than others because you are worried about overall distribution. So overall entropy will be preserved and you will not have uh, any way to more easily break it. Mm. Also, you can just make your character set length a multiple of 256. So basically some power of two. So if you had here, basically 16 characters in the character set, uh, every single character would have an equal probability without discarding anything. So that's another solution that you can apply. But the downside of that is that this relies on you having a specific character set length, which can be broken during some uh, pull request or something like that. So, which is not something that we want. So normally you go for something that cannot be as easily broken by just changing one character. So, and one more question to ask is, how exactly are we, oh, sorry, one more thing don't do utf8 encoding so just don't let me show you why so i will be showcasing this on a node.js example let me make it slightly bigger so we have in this case um, we can just pretty much encode any buffer in node.js to utf8 so as you can see we just created Black, one would you please um you know, make larger the font, please. Work now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So in this case, you can create a buffer with any bytes in node, and like it looks fine to us. And then we can just encode it to a string as said. And let's just say that we decided to use UTF-8. So we just provided with a command to do us UTF-8 encoding of the string. And if you output it, you get three similar looking characters, but maybe that's just a quirk of uh, node, it just doesn't display those correctly. But what you actually get is three instances of the same exact value. So for example, in Node.js, the quirk is that everything above 7f, and that would be 127, I think, uh, in the uh, decimal system, it pretty much just gets converted to the exact same value. And when you convert it back to bytes, for example, you will, you will get a character sequence of uh, 
if we have deviating, which is Unicode for uh, bad byte or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact name for this uh, three byte character. But point is, all of the like half your options are going to get converted into one byte. And one of the actual practical samples of the attack that I saw was a token cons consistent of 10 such values. And you had a like 0.1% chance to get a token which just consider consisted of all EFB, FBD in all places. So pretty much just uh, 10 UTF-8 characters like that and 30 bytes. You can just like make around a few thousand requests to the system, finally get this token and break administrator authentication. So this is like from a real system. Uh, just don't use UTF-8. So instead opt for something like Base64 or something like that. So Base64 doesn't have this problem. So, and it's as easy as just doing this. So you just replace one value with another in most cases. Like most modern languages, it's like very simple to implement this way. Okay. Now, one more interesting question to look into is, okay, now we can generate those values. Now we can pretty much create our tokens, passwords, we know how to do this more or less securely. But question is, how do we make practical use of it? So how do we store those tokens and passwords in our backend application and still keep it secure? So what is secure in this case? So, and normally, when storing stuff like tokens, passwords, and, uh, et cetera, like maybe password to Z links or invites, usually you consider these things. So it should not be possible to privilege escalate into a user or administrator account just using a database read. So the scenario here is that some other part of the application, which you might not even control, has an SQL injection, which lets the user just, sorry, lets the attacker just dump the database. And in this case, that's where the attacker should stop. So he shouldn't be able to then go ahead and get access into your administrator account because he has full database. Um, any secrets should not be exposed through a database read. So um, again, when speaking about secrets, I'm not speaking just about passwords. It might be some credentials your backend use to actually communicate with external systems, or it might be some secret data that you store at there, which you might not want to be exposed. Mm. Also, passwords must be handled according to industry best practices. So passwords have a heap of their own requirements. And when you do this, entropy should also be preserved. So you cannot, uh, when you do some encoding on your token, you cannot pretty much just lose entropy there. So sometimes there is also a much stronger requirement to protect against database rights for the set tokens. But usually it's considerably harder to achieve. We will look into how to do that. but Usually, it needs a lot more system design in mind. Mm. So to store the tokens, you can store so-called hash of the token instead of the token. So hash, uh, in English, not a super common word, but it's like, like cut up meat, for example. So basically, you just say that instead of having a row string, you just make it into a mess of bytes. So, and in this case, we are speaking about cryptographic hashes, not your CRC32 that you might be familiar with from using zip archives. So this cryptographic hash actually must satisfy a bunch of requirements. So it should be hard to produce a function input that results in a specific output. It should be hard to produce two inputs resulting in the same in specific output. The same input always results in the same output. So basically the function must be deterministic. Uh, a small change to the message should change the hash value so extensively that a new hash value appears uncorrelated with the old hash value. So if you put it into more simpler terms, a like butterfly effect applies. So like one letter change in your value should change your hash almost completely. So, and it should be quick to compute the hash value for any given message for normal hashes. And the usual recommendation for from NIST is to use SHA-512 or SHA-256, uh, with difference being lar larger lengths for the SHA-512 version. And uh, also there is SHA-3, which is a more modern hash function, but currently it has some issues and it's not widely adopted. So 
I will still suggest that you use SHA-512 instead. And also two hash functions that have to be avoided are SHA-1 and MD-5. So because those functions are cryptographically insecure, so both of them have like detected collisions. So basically they break at the very least the second property. So, and that means that, for example, if you used your hash to validate the integrity of your document, then uh, you can produce two documents which have different contents, but have the same hash at the same time. So not a like very good thing. So in cryptographic context, these functions should be discarded. Uh, questions so far? Okay, seems, okay. Seems like none. okay, let's continue. So here is a sample function. So this is specifically SHA-1. While it has been broken, it's still very good to demo because it has relative short digest. So um, as you can see, like for this message specifically is very good to show. So one letter change completely changes the hash output. Swapping two letters completely changes the hash output. And removing one letter also completely changes the hash output. And well, obviously, uh, like completely extending the word Fox to another sentence also completely changes the hash output. So basically, hash com looks completely random related to the data and even the smallest changes uh, that happen in there. So those hashes don't have any visible correlation or more specifically something computationally distinguishable. So you cannot compute it on a machine either. So if anyone wants to play with a hash function live, there is this website I posted to chat. So you can just like set up a function and attempt to hash uh, some of the stuff. So this is output that you will get there for Shaman, for example. Mm. And then to store the token, we can use this construction. So to store the token, we can pretty much insert into the database the SHA-512 value of a token or SHA-256 value of a token. And then to check if such token exists, we can select this token from the database by the, like its hash. So instead of directly storing the token, we store the hash. So in this construction, it's basically impossible to extract the token from the database, which pretty much satisfies our considerations. And it's still possible to check that the token exists. So somebody might argue that this may limit flexibility. So for example, you cannot say return the same token twice when you log in. But usually when you do this for tokens, uh, this flexibility limitation will be part of the requirements anyways. So for example, by OWASP, again, this project that they named, uh, it's usually required that for every new login, you will return a new token that you cannot, like even if the login happens from the same machine and happens within 100 milliseconds, you cannot return the same session twice. So you should return different ones. And pretty much this loss of flexibility is usually negligible. So also we can achieve some extra security by using a so-called HMAC. So HMAC is an acronym of hash-based message authentication code. And pretty much it pairs a hash function, cryptographic hash, with a key. So HMAC provides message authentication using a shared secret instead of digital signatures, which you might be used to from certificates if you ever work with digital certificates. And like as with any message authentication code, it can be used simultaneously to verify data integrity and also authenticity of the message. So basically in layman terms, we make it so that our authenticity of what we put to the database is controlled. So if somebody tries to write a new value there, uh, we will detect this instead of uh, just proceeding as normal in this case. And you can replace your construction with something like this, where key is stored outside of the database. So consider that it is some environment variable passed to your application or something similar. Mm. So, and this for why, this is exactly like our way to provide write protections. So if the attacker can pretty much perform database writes, he can obviously compute hashes as well. So hash functions are not secret. Uh, but if you use HMAC, 
the attacker must also have the key somehow, which is which if you don't expose it to the database, which is normally the case, uh, he will not be able to do like just from the database, right? And you can also defeat modifying other fields with this. So for example, you can include in HMAC your entire record in the database instead of just the token. So this will guarantee even stronger protection. So the attacker cannot reuse a token he already knows and just insert a new user ID in this case. Uh, but then again, as you can see, it might be slightly harder to implement, especially if you have like mass selections for valid sessions for a user or something like that. So you need to like have extra considerations before doing this. And this all obviously presumes that the key is not stored in the database because otherwise the, the attacker just needs to also read the key from the database, encrypt your like, sorry, sign your tokens with HMAC and just store that instead of the token. So this pretty much defeats the purpose of having an, like something with a key. Don't store your key in the same place as your data. So now we learned how to store some application secrets. So something like a token, something like an API secret, which is random. And question to you guys, can we use the same hash function as this for passwords? That's right, correct? So can we do that? So obviously password will not be easily recoverable from that. So would it be a good idea? Mm -hmm. um, okay. yeah. In general, we, we need a, a, another source maybe for additional entropy. Mm, yes, that's one thing to add there. So your passwords normally don't have a lot of entropy. So like a lot of users just repeat the passwords up to a ridiculous 95% of a dumped uh, hash set from uh, LinkedIn in 2012, 2012, I think, you can brute force it on a common GPU. So yes, you might need some, some extra entropy, but in case of passwords, it is not exactly that, but that's one thing. Another thing I already mentioned is brute force protection. So SHA-256 SHA are designed to be quick to compute. So on a normal GPU, like something that you can grab off the shelf, you can get billions of of hashes per second. So you can compute like above this number, just to make it clear on the number of zeros I posted it to chat. So that's on a single GPU. I'm not even speaking about people who have enough money to get a small computational array or enough money to actually like have a whole like farm with hundreds of them. So you will get a pre pretty crazy values for attempts on passwords per second if you dump the hash. So no, you cannot simply use the same function. So at the very least, you lack the following requirements. So you don't prevent any brute force attacks. And actually HMAC actually happens to help against this because if the attacker just gets HMAC of the password and not the hash, he will not be able to brute force. So he will be able to brute force only after the key is also leaked. But this is weak because again, if the key is leaked, then he can pretty much just quickly brute force your entire data set. Also, the users can have the same passwords. So you should expect that your users are not truly random. So, and uh, as the hash is deterministic, if the two users have the same exact password, they will have the same exact entry on the database for the hash. And uh, because of that, if users use something stupid for a password, you'll probably see uh, thousands of entries for that hash. So, which is not acceptable. So we need some special kind of a hash here. So we cannot just use like normal SHA-256, which we just established for our tokens. And here, some of the strongest scheme I have seen was done by Dropbox. So I'll pretty much just refer to their original article because their infographic is just like super self-explanatory. So instead of just hashing the password with a normal hash, or just doing something like bcrypt, which is a common recommendation for a password, they actually do this structure. So they first 
hash the password with SHA-512, then they hash the password with bcrypt with a salt, which is like exactly that entropy that we needed. So a bunch of random bytes, specifically eight in case of Dropbox. Uh, and they pretty much use that salt, which is unique per user. And uh, they hash the SHA-512 value. And then they also additionally encrypted when storing on the database. So every piece of things here actually serves some purpose. So for example, SHA-512 specifically is used to bypass the crypt limitation. So normally the crypt cannot handle passwords longer than 72 bytes because otherwise it would be a DOS attack. So in case of this Dropbox approach, you get, um, sorry, I will restart presenting full screen. So with this Dropbox approach, you will get 64 bytes from SHA-512 and eight bytes from SALT. So you are exactly at length limit. And also the crypt is a function that prevents like most of uh, brute forcing attacks because specifically it's designed to be really hard to brute force on a GPU. So it's memory complex. And I think that statistics from a crazy array with eight uh, GPUs like uh, 1080 NVIDIA, um, it produced only 100,000 hashes per second for, for the crypt. I don't remember what uh, complexity, but I, think, but I think it was 12, sorry, it was 10. So, Complexity for the crypt is scaling logarithmically. So like it's like exponential kind of scale. So 12 is like four times as hard to compute as 10. And uh, you can pretty much just dynamically increase complexity as well to counter uh, the Moore's law where your computer computes twice as fast every think how much, 18 months now. And uh, the crypt also bundles support for the salt. So you don't have to implement this manually. And encrypting them is like something that you can do against database leaks. So even if somebody leaks your encrypted hashes, they still cannot brute force them until they get your key. And after you get your key, you have all of these considerations. So this is how like industry guys like top dogs do passwords. So questions? Okay, seems like none. So now we pretty much just discussed the secrets which we don't need to recover in terms of backend itself. So uh, tokens that you don't need the exact value on the backend or passwords that you also don't need the exact value to validate uh, access. But what about something like SMTP credentials? So like you have a mail server integration. You want your backend to be able to present the password, but you also don't want to expose your password. So in this case, you should encrypt the secret, the secret and not hash it. So, but encryption is also very easy to mishandle as we will see. Uh, later down the line, I have good examples for this. Uh, what I suggest is that you use some very strong and very well-known schema instead of designing your own. Uh, like two very strong approaches to do this is to just use a so-called AEID mode. And that would be authenticated encryption with associated data, uh, which will provide you both encryption and message authentication. Uh, because like encryption itself, it does allow message manipulation. So somebody will be able to replace your secret with something of their own, even without knowing your key or your data. So like CBC mode is specifically notorious for that. Or you can use a strong encryption mode, like again, the mentioned AES mode, which provides just the encryption. And then you can also authenticate the data. So uh, compute Hmac from it so that nobody can tamper with it. Uh, but a huge point is that there is also this cryptographic doom principle is that um, if you have to perform any cryptographic operation before verifying the Mac on the message you have received, it is somehow will inevitably lead to doom. So it will somehow be broken. I would say this extends also not just for cryptographic operations, but it also extends for many of the normal operations as well. So if you use your, like, if you first read your encryption algorithm from the data and then you validate HMAC, it led to issues. And reading your encryption algorithm is not exactly a cryptographic operation. So, and this article pretty much describes why on a uh, error that happened in actual TLS, 
when they did first authentication and then encryption. So you first encrypt and then sign, not the other way around. Um, it describes pretty much an attack on SSH. But if you want to dive here, it will take our presentation five hours. So I'll have to leave it up to you. So if you want, you can read this in the article. So I will uh, link it to you. So I will provide presentation in the end, but if you want to look at it right now, I posted it to chat. And as I have said, building your own encryption schema is a insanely hard problem. So just don't go there. Also, when using encryption libraries, you should target some really strong encryption libraries. So one of the uh, say famous samples are OpenSSL and also Google's fork of that, boring SSL with a bunch of features removed. And those features are usually insecure. So a good fork to use for you. Also, some of the languages have a really strong built-in cryptographic libraries. So for example, Nodes Crypto is one sample. So it's really good because it's based on guys like OpenSSL in the first place. I think also you can say that Golang's crypto library is okay. So another huge point is that don't attempt to construct con attempt to construct your own code to perform like raw crypto. Follow library examples here. So for example, in Node.js there is this nice sample to perform decryption. So it's pretty much line by line how you do this with uh, like objects as, with streams, with pipe streams, with uh, like synchronous operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you want to integrate it, you consult this example instead of doing it from scratch yourself, and you pretty much take all the considerations. Uh, also, as we will see, some libraries do provide simplified way to use crypto. So they have their own downsides, but the upside is that all the decisions are made for you. You just have like your Encrypt function, generate key function, and decrypt function. You don't have to specify anything else. So this is the upside of using such libraries. Downside is lack of interoperability. So, and during reviews, I do suggest that you consult library samples. And if the code you are pretty much reviewing right now produces something that remotely, even remotely doesn't look like the library output, you should flag it in a code review. Or if it is your own code, pretty much consider if you should completely rewrite it. So at the point, it might be better this way. So now we are switching to examples section. Do you have any questions about theory? I think we can go stay to the examples. Yeah, something like that. So first huge sample is a case study of uh, Kaspersky password manager issue. So it's publicly disclosed, so we are pretty much free to talk about it. And moreover, here is the article URL. So, and specifically, uh, they pretty much just decided to ignore all, all of the industry recommendations altogether. Uh, so we'll just see how exactly they did it. So at first, uh, KPM to generate a character, like if you remember how we generated, if we just generated our row bytes and it coded them into random characters, the PM decided to elect a completely different ap approach to generate uh, characters from the character set. So to pick a letter, KPM generates two random flows in ranges from zero to one, multiplies them together, and then, the multiplied, uh, and then multiplies the result by length of the character set and just produces pretty much the character at the position that pretty much resulted here. Um, like consider that you transform post into integer at some point. So this is the code for this. Um, distribution formula, I gave it on the right. Uh, but even without looking at the chart for it, we can, or at this result, we can pretty much uh, understand that probably something in the beginning of the character set will be generated much more often than something at the end, because like, Num when you multiply two numbers between zero and one, they tend to get smaller after that. So the result is smaller than either of the numbers. So it's going to be leaning towards like the beginning of the character set. And here is the actual distribution. So um, pretty much we see from the chart from the charts that what I just said is correct. Characters at the start of the character set will appear a lot more often. And question is just why. So 
Can anybody make a conjecture as per why somebody might think this is even a good idea after reading all of the industry requirements? So I presume that Kaspersky of all companies probably knows about them. Um, I, I, I'll risk um, something worry, else. Worry. I think perhaps the the you can you can use really um, I don't know special symbols at the at the beginning of the char set. I don't know, like mm -hmm. like really um, uncommon, and 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 with that you can turn the skewness in your favor in your favor. Right. I, I don't know if that if that is correct, but um, you can exploit in that way, like using uncommon characters in the start and the most common char uh, charts, uh, uh, symbols in the end. And, and to be honest, you would be right. So this is like extremely close to what they actually did, except that instead of like using some weird characters like, I don't know, uh, exclamation marks, still does or something like that in the start, and uh, characters like from normal alphabet in the end, they actually ordered the alphabet this way. So Kaspersky attempted to generate passwords that are rarely met as a word in some language. And specifically, this specific distribution they had thanks to having this line and ordering the character set from like the least probable characters in the language to the most probable ones. It like pretty closely resembles the chart for English. So not one to one, but pretty darn close. So I think it's visible uh, like easily. So while not exactly English, it's uncomfortably close. So, and like pretty much character set is ordered inverse compared to the probability of the letter. And later down the line, these probabilities are also further modified on the already generated characters in the character set. So after a Z appears, probability for another Z is increased, but for H it is decreased. But if the H is generated, probability for another H is increased. So resulting probabilities look somewhat like this. So for example, if you type a Z, so which is not super probable, afterwards for Z, you have a hugely like insane probability to get one more Z. But if you get an H, which suddenly becomes not probable after you type a Z, if getting Z H H is like very probable. So they attempt to also, as they generate the password, to modify the probabilities in such a way that it's not going to be words. So for example, ZH is probably more or less a normal word start, but ZHH is not. Is not. Is that clear? Or should I explain it a little bit better? OK. Maybe a little bit. Uh, you can uh, uh, dig it a little bit more. Mm, yeah, so for example, like normally in a language, so outside of just character probabilities, you have probabilities of certain uh, sets of characters. So for example, after T, it's very common to see an H. So what Kaspersky would attempt to do most probably is that if, you, if they already generated the T as the first password of the character, they would decrease the probability of H, which is really common after a T. So this way, they attempt to generate passwords that will not resemble words. So, or like any common uh, character configuration in English. So at least it looks this, a lot this way from how they modify the probabilities. So this is one way uh, to explain it, I think. And for example, ZH is one example. So, and specifically, all this was created as your uh like friend already said it's all to trick password cracking tools so like john Ripper will attempt to crack passwords by humans like by default and not by kpm but password by humans usually are based on words or like there is like if you speak in a scientific language there is a hidden markov model behind human passwords so and kpm try to defeat specifically that so they try to generate passwords that don't anyhow resemble words and this way, they will be far down the default list for John's Reaper. But a huge point is that if you know this, you can pretty much just reverse your list and try the least common passwords by humans first, which is 
what KPM tried to produce. So one of the simplest way to do this would be to pretty much adapt your Markov model to what KPM does instead of what humans do. So that's like one way to do it. Or you can pretty much just go for uncommon passwords first. Something like that is completely possible. So, and this is exactly why instead of doing something complex like that, the industry recommendation is to do uniform generation. Because if the attacker finds out how exactly you manage to skew your generator, he can adapt his tools. So this is like hugely important point when you do password generation for your website, for example. Use a library that actually does uniform passwords. Mm. Issue number two is the generator they used. So specifically, they used the Mersenne Twister generator that I already mentioned. So it is vulnerable to state recovery. So for state recovery of Mersenne Twister, you need a massive 624 outputs from the generator. But in our case, straightforward attack is like incredibly hard because every single character is actually a product of two outputs. And moreover, passwords are only 12 characters long. So you probably will need 52 passwords to have a chance of state recovery, or maybe even more because of multiplication. And uh, it's really hard to get to like real result of the multiplication. So despite random number generation being an issue, it's like really hard to attack in this specific case. So you cannot easily predict what uh, the next character will be from, like or what, what the next password will be from the previous one. So state recovery is probably not feasible against like this specific issue, but again, using Mersenne Twister and password generation is usually not a good idea. Uh, pretty much no obvious attack, unfortunately. So sometimes security issues are like that. So you have something massive, but it's completely unexploitable right here. So it's still something to consider, but it happens. So this is normal. And issue number three is that uh, KPM uses a really short seed and in a really weird way. So the seed they use to initialize the password generator is only 32 bits long because like int, int cannot have more than 32 bits. And also, a new instance of the random number generator is created every single time. So uh, when you like seed it with a seed, it has only two to the power of 32 possible states. So KPM for a given character set can never generate only around 4 billion passwords. So a little bit above than that, but two to the power of 32. Mm. And that's like an issue because you can just create a list of all those four billion passwords to test against them for like every common character set. But there is a bigger issue. So as you can see, uh, if no seed is passed, so specifically seed of equals zero is passed, it will use current system time as, this, as the seed. But um, if you look at actual password generation methods that calls this, it passes time zero as the seed anyways. So this is pretty much means that between say 2020 and 2021, KPM could only generate uh, 315 million passwords for a given character sets. And knowing the creation time for the password, which would in many cases be account creation date, which is in many forums is actually exposed, for example it can reduce the possibilities for the passwords even down only to like thousands or hundreds of passwords, depending on how exact the registration time is. So like if you have it down to a minute, you probably have to try like 100 passwords and that's it. You will break the password by KPM. And also of note in the article, it also said that there is a bug in the code that leads to an out of bounds read, which sometimes leads to extra entropy for uppercase letters because it starts to read uninitialized memory for like probabilities or something similar. But this is like, I, my point is that this is larger besides the, like the point of this article, of this like discussion, because using software barks to make random number generation more secure is not a good way to go about it. So what if in that data there is something sensitive because it got released from some application uh, that actually handles sensitive data, but didn't initialize, uh, like zero it out for some reason. So it suddenly can leak into your password somehow. So it might lead to like complications. So and this is it for KPM. So this is like how you exploit issues with number generation in like a large 
production environment. So, and here is a smaller toy example. So this is based entirely on real, real life sample. So I left the link to past bin to anyone who wants to view the source code. I will post it to chat. I myself will open it in an IDE. Give me a moment. So this is the bad encryption. So uh, it pretty much looks very strong. So it uses a strong modern cryptography library in Python. It uses really good primitives. So it only uses uh, stuff like uh IES and CBC. So this is very normal for encryption. So it looks like solid. Yes, it doesn't have signatures, but encryption itself is fine. And on the first glance, it looks like we are using bootstrap encryption mode. And moreover, we are using it with long keys that can be provided. And like there is nothing obvious here, at least something that like looks out of place from functions, even. But if you look further down the line, so specifically, this encryption function, it, it's like it's not how it is supposed to look like for any encryption mode. So in here, instead of what's normally expected from encryption libraries, like you passing your entire array of data to the encryptor, which is created from the library, you pass it like block by block. And moreover, you create a new instance of uh, encryption for every single block. So you are not supposed to manually cut your message into blocks like when doing encryption like this with a library. So moreover, when you create the cipher, encryption object is created using a fixed initialization vector, which is passed down the line from user, which is not really a correct way to use CBC. So if you, so if you see examples and read what IV is used for, it's used for uh, making uh, encrypting the same message twice produce different results. So normally, it's supposed to be generated during message encryption. And it's supposed to be attached to the message itself, encrypted version. And it's not supposed to be provided as a user input. Moreover, you're not supposed to like reuse the IV and create like uh, the encryption object multiple times. Uh, and as we encrypt block by block manually with the fixed IV, it looks very similar to how ECB mode works. So instead of having Mm, something like this schema and actually uh, Wikipedia is a good source for like good infographics on how it's supposed to work instead of producing something like this which it, which it would produce by default we are obviously doing something like this in uh, inside of our plain text so we are pretty much just creating the block cipher encryption from scratch passing it like 16 bytes of data and we produce some cipher text with the same key and this has happens happened this happens repeatedly in the loop so if you look at what schema this corresponds to, this is ECB. So you would largely expect, even without seeing how it works in uh, actual uh, code and actual samples, we expect that it will be performing like a lot like ECB, which produces repeated blocks down to like having encrypted images show up like that. Uh, yeah. So if you encrypt an image with it, you can sometimes make out the the image itself if you pretty much just renders the blocks into some color, even without knowing exact colors. So you get the outline of the image without any uh, decryptions. And moreover, you are expecting to get repeated blocks because if you encrypt the ciphertext multiple times with the same key, you get the same plain text. So if you run the code with this input and these keys, we will get this output and I pretty much just highlighted the repeated block we expect. So let me showcase how it actually works in the code. Mm. So uh, I have VN here, Python script Py. So the script is created to produce you help messages. So you can pretty much pass around keys like this. So block size for a yes is actually 16 bytes. So we will produce, we will provide it a 16 bytes of repeated text in the message. So 10 and 6. Let's copy it and create two repeated blocks. And as you can see, we see this exact result. And important point is that due to how our encryption works, we generate some of the random data in the end. So we do some random choice of characters. 
So, and we pretty much just get uh, like random tails because of this. But the first two blocks are actual data. And as you can see, they remain unaltered in both runs. So just to showcase, we can pretty much alter a character for the same key. And the repeated block will be there, but it will be different. So, and the main danger here is that if you run this in decryption node, so you can mix and match data from different messages to produce valid ones. Let me showcase it to you. So I pretty much just took data from uh, different messages. And now I will pass the decrypt command. So the attacker who doesn't really know anything about the plain texts and just have seen the cipher text like this guy and this guy, he can produce a new entirely valid uh, cipher text with a message that like, contains the first half of the first message and second half of the second message. So this is pretty dangerous, I would say. So this is what like using your crypto without consulting how it's supposed to work with the library leads to. So normally you try to avoid this. So here I pretty much just document this for you to like later review. Mm. So and here is a partially fixed example for you. So I will post it to you. And I pretty much just went ahead and rewrote this bad sample that like it came from a real project. So I pretty much rewrote the encryption part to how it's supposed to look like for ECB mode. So as you can see, we pretty much generate a new ID for every message. So new initialization vector. We encode the message to bytes. We create the encryptor and we pretty much encrypt all the message in one go. And we return the vector plus the message as the result of encryption. And then in decryption, we do inverse. So we decode base 64, we take the AV, we create the decryptor, and we decrypt the entire message in one go. And also, we pretty much remove the padding we add. So another question that I left for you to review is what to do about the padding. So this is not a correct way to do the padding for encryption purposes. But this is for you to see how it works. So let me show you how it works in uh, code as well. Key is like whatever you like. I used the short key here just for samples. So as you can see, now output looks like completely random value. And if you, even if you encrypt the same message twice, it produces another completely random value. So as you can see, we fixed the ECB problem entirely. So also note that we don't encode every block separately. So we just encode the entire thing with base64. So this is how you fix encryption. So this was based on uh, library documentation. So pretty much that. What I left uncovered is how to do padding. So to actually make the message a multiple of 16 in length, this is what you must do with, when using block ciphers. I implemented my own padding. So this is not a correct way to do it. And for the reader, I leave to pretty much see how to do this with this PKCS7 padding manually. So using this library. Also, key derivation is not done correctly. So if you look at how we, sorry, this is uh, next part of samples. So if we look at how exactly we derive the key, we pretty much just add digits to the key. So this is not how you derive the key from user input. So for that, you have actual functions. So which let you derive the key from like more or less weak randomness and correctly derive them while preserving all the randomness. So for example, hkdf function is one of them. So I pretty much left a link to it. And also there is no message signature. So I didn't add it. So like an exercise would be to switch this to a authenticated encry encryption mode or to use signatures. Also, there is a much easier way to do this. You can just use uh, this library, which pretty much just made all the decisions for you. So you don't need to provide any a yes or any to take any decisions on which padding do you use or like whatever. It pretty much just encrypts with your key and then decrypts your token with your key. So major point is that this is not interoperable with other languages or libraries. But at the same time, it's very easy if you use just Python. So instead of like doing all the decisions that I just listed, you can pretty much just call generate key it will generate a key of the correct length. You can just initialize your encryption. You can just encrypt, no strings attached. So it will take into consideration all of this here. 
So this is pretty valid for many projects. Any questions? Mm -hmm. mm, okay, I see a question in chat, which mm, goes back to this example. So it is not non-uniform because of how KPM does number generation. So specifically, KPM generates, uh, sorry, uh, two random values, so like this. So the non-uniformity comes from this distribution. So if instead KPM would follow just one uh, random number from a uniform generator, like say OpenSSL rand, or at that point, even Mercant Vista one, it would have uniform distribution. So this issue would not be present. Primary issue comes from this method of number generation. So this is like what math says for it. It doesn't come from the usage of English language. So they pretty much construct this non-uniformity to match their idea to abuse English language model to make more rare passwords, so to speak. But this is how they constructed this part, not the language they used to generate from the character set. Okay, great. Let's switch back. Okay, no more questions asked. So let's look at practical examples of state recovery. So let's say that, for example, we just saw that state recovery might not be practical in many cases. So for example, um, in RNG used for passwords in KPM, state recovery was a hard problem. But um, we can show you, like I can show you a practical place for this attack. So for example, if you generate your tokens like that, they will have raw output for the generator. And this is a pretty valid way to generate tokens. So like uh, producing bytes from your random number generator and just like attaching them together into a long enough string is a, how you normally generate tokens. So let me actually show how that works in practice if you write a generator like that. So this is a sample that's on the screenshot and I, I can just run it. So I will produce like tokens, which if somebody is familiar with how like session ID looks, they are even slightly longer than what you would expect from a session ID. So this is pretty much like valid way to generate your tokens. So, but obviously you can convert it back to actual uh, like output. And in this case, it's actually pretty easy to do state recovery. So my example is based on a GitHub repo, but I made it a little bit like added a little bit more practical sample to it. And for how Mercant Twister works, I will quote the exact tool. So the internal state of a Mercant Twister consists of 624 integers and an index. So whenever a number, a random number is requested, a tampering function is applied to the integer to which the index is currently pointing, and the index is incremented. So basically what you do is you, as a random value, you will put a tamper of that, of that uh, variable in the state. So, and when index reaches 624, we generate a new set of 624 integers based on this data set, which is what is called the twist. So this is why it's called the Mersen twister. And recovery, like just reading this, we can see that recovery will work correctly if, when con if we can construct an inverse function uh, to the tempering one. And temper function is like, this is from a sample Mercant Twister implementation, which matches what's in Python. And for some reason, GitHub doesn't work for me. Okay, it loaded. So temper function looks like this. So it's not exactly hard to inverse. So it's like bit shifts and XORs. So this is something that's more or less easy, um, more or less easily inversible. So, and if you look at the example that the library did, so this is the code from the library that I found. This is the, pretty much the reverse of the tampering function. So as you can see, it literally just, uh, the, he pretty much just reversed the order of operations applied to the variable and he reversed their effort. So it has like a shift right and a shift left implemented here. And Go will pretty much just run untampers on the function and validate that the output is correct. 
plus it will also apply brute force in case it gives it at least one more number. It will check if like the generation started not from the very beginning. So, and here is a practical sample. So consider that uh, first you generated some tokens that you don't know how much it was used. So just say one, two, three, four times. So 1,234 times. Then you leak something. So say a bunch of tokens, like from here, you just like authenticate the 100 or 200 times to leak all those values. So in very quick succession. And then some other user authenticates after you, but you don't get that. And presume that here we just got the leak. So we have nothing else to work by. So we create the Mercant Twister recovery class. We ask it to run the untwist on all the inputs. And then we attempt to generate as random numbers with the generator it initialized with the state it just recovered. And we want to assert that they are exactly similar as to what the next user received. So if you run it, you, as you can see, this assert never failed, and also the value output is the same. So without getting the verification anywhere here, we are able to generate the same exact numbers. And thus, we'll be able to construct the same exact tokens as here, so you can defeat authentication like this. So this is a practical example of how recovery might work. So moreover, similar recovery actually happened in production for me. So with a small twist. So let me actually explain. So it's feasible, but sometimes it's impractical. So for me, uh, I knew that generation for Mercent Twister happened in a large batch of 100 tokens, but I only ever received one. And one token has three values to go by, which is by far not enough for full state recovery. But language used was the PHP language, and the seed for Mercant Twister is only 32 bits, so at least in PHP. So you can brute force it still and just validate that your three values is what appears at the beginning of the generation. Um, this is pretty much very practical. So whoever wants to look at how it works in PHP can refer to this. So and one of the last examples to look for, I already mentioned it, is pretty much breaking the mass random in uh, JavaScript lottery posted by a night times. And the process here is largely very similar to Mercant Twister. So just to spoil what's in the article is that instead of manually inverting the function, we use the so-called symbolic execution. I will try to explain what that is because pretty heavy concept. And for that, we use an SMT solver from Microsoft. So called Z3. So let me show you. So as we already have some bootstrap into the random number generation, XOR shift generates your number like this. So it has state zero and state one as its state. So instead of like 624 values like the Mercen Twister, this one has like two states. And when generating, it just follows this procedure, which is, as you can see, also not as complex mathematically. And uh, it pretty much takes this value as a generated one and like it does manipulate state beforehand. So the generated value is used as output and state zero, state one is used for like further random numbers. So while it's not really that complex mathematically, it would be painful to inverse this because of like the, here being a sum or something like that. We want to do some more generic approach where we don't uh, have to manually do this. And for this, we can use symbolic execution. So I'll skip a ton of explanations here, but I will show you how that looks like. So instead of um, pretty much creating um, the inverse function manually, we create a bunch of uh, symbolic states which we don't know the value of and apply some operations Internally, that's three pretty much just converts those operations to mathematical expressions. And we provide the resulting values for them. So specifically this condition. So we pretty much add like all of these uh, conditions we just constructed to the set of equations we want to solve. And then we just ask the RSMT solver to attempt to recover the states given the numbers we have. And we do this right here. So 
In here, we have a ton of browser specifics, which are not as interesting. So specifically, he goes into differences between Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. But I don't think that like voicing them here will make them more like more understandable. If you really want to get how this works, I would suggest to read this on the low level. On the high level, this is what was happening here. So and after he gets both states here, he can go ahead and generate random numbers for the lottery digits. And pretty much he had some issues with cross browsers because like analytics libraries also used the same random number generator and he had to account for some of the randomness going into them. But as you can see, this is the result the author got here. This is not no different from what I did for MSN Twister except for the approach. So pretty much that. Uh, questions about any anything in the presentation? Okay, I think uh, we were just on, in time. Um, yeah. Thanks, Vlad. I think it's, it's been great. Uh, how common are these uh, attacks? in the wild, uh, for example, uh, for uh, preserving the state, uh, recovering the state, sorry. So common enough for me to meet this attack three times in a pen test of a really large project, like really large project. I cannot say names, but like consider more than a million users in each of them. And they had all of these issues. So moreover, Kaspersky is a very well-known antivirus and they have issues with random number generation. So, I mean, it's very easy to meet. And I think this is why it's actual top two issue. So it's not like top 10, it's top two. So at first, uh, OWASP didn't have this as a category, but they had a bunch of symptoms as categories. So now they restructured to have the root cause as a category instead. So this is how common those issues are. And this, like, for example, so this is pretty much what happened like in real life. So this is like what I encountered uh, not so long ago, I think a year ago or something like that. So thankfully I didn't make it to production because of good review process. And this is what I recommended to you guys. So you should review this. So if you review this and validate with the libraries, you will not let such code pass into your like repositories or public projects. So yeah. Okay. Any other question? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for um, giving this talk, especially yep. for uh, the uh, university uh, students. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone who can uh, may have a doubt, I think. Uh, um uh you can uh, uh provide the the email right yeah i'll provide actually a bunch of contacts to me so okay. if you watch this presentation later down the line because let's be honest for one hour 30 minutes that's a ton of material so like one of the hardest to understand of us categories i would say more or less explained so I would presume that you have a bunch of questions to ask me. So I'll also give you my personal email. So you can just write me questions about this. Also, I will probably provide this as a PDF. So you will be able to get the presentation as well with all the links in it. Great. OK. Um, uh, Vlad has a great experience in CDF, as he mentioned at the beginning. So anyone trying to get exercises or get started with this sort of CTF, um, you may contact him. Um, this is a, um, an awesome opportunity to, to learn. Yeah. Okay. So let me actually insert contact details right here. Okay. okay. And the uh, personal one. Um, pretty much ping me on like any of these.
Okay. Okay, thanks also everybody for attending. And yep. I hope that you have enjoyed this uh, uh, this talk as much as I did. <laughs> yeah, I hope it was understandable, so yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. See you in the next uh, topic. Yep, see ya. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, Vlad. Thank, thank you, everyone.